Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to talk about how you would have done if you were simply cloning Monish Pabrai over the last six odd years from you know, the end of 2014 to the end of 2020. Uh, so I pulled the 13F data for, you know, what is it, 23 quarters, the last 23 quarters from the SEC, and I compiled it all in here uh, just to get a sense. You know, if you had bought when it was clear that Pabrai had been buying uh, and you had sold when it was revealed that Pabrai had sold, how would you have done over the last nearly six years? Uh, I made a similar video uh, like this about Michael Burry a few days ago, and I just wanted to address, uh, I got some comments uh, along the lines of, you know, if you're just cloning other investors, you're not really investing, okay? And I want to address that really quickly here. So Benjamin Graham, kind of the godfather of value investing, uh, you know, he, he gave a precise definition of investing, and it goes like this. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Okay, that is the definition of investing. Now, you know, of course, Warren Buffett recommends people who don't want to research, understand businesses, just buy the S&P 500 index. Um, and of course, when you're doing that, you're not diving into businesses. You're not trying to understand the 500 businesses that make up the S&P 500. Uh, now, Monish Pabrai, actually, back in 2012, in a talk at Ivy University, uh, basically encouraged this student to set up a fund where you're simply cloning great investors, okay? And I wanna play this clip for you guys really quick here. I hope this works, let's try. Investing business receives all the time. Nobody is willing to clone. Okay, you know, if if I if I tell you this uh, this method of you know buying and bucket buy sell when he sells, I've said this to so many business school students. I don't know anyone. I don't know any fund even now that is set up that does that. In fact, you. What's your name? <laughs> David. You can do this. <laughs> opportunity to set up a fund where you shut your brain off and just do this. Send your brain to the beach. <laughs> and and you be enormously wealthy. Do it, David. <laughs> Great clip. So I'm going to link to this. Uh, it's well worth watching the whole talk. Terrible um, audio quality, but just fantastic content in this 2012 uh, lecture from Monish Pabrai. So essentially there he's saying, you know, you can do better than the market. You can do fabulously as an investment fund just by cloning other investors, turning your brain off, not trying to understand the businesses. Um, but having uh, an intelligent approach to cloning great investors. And part of that intelligent approach is making sure uh, you're not getting in your own way emotionally, making emotional decisions uh, when things happen in the markets, not seeing Mr. Market as um, someone who's, you know, giving you business advice by, you know, when, when the market drops, you know, inciting panic and fear and, and selling at the wrong times. So, you know, that, that's a huge part of investing is that uh, emotional reactiveness to buying and selling and holding companies. Um, so I wanted to share that. Another thing I want to share about this question of is shamelessly cloning, is cloning without understanding the businesses, is that investing? Well, you know, Monish Pabrai, uh, every year he puts out 15 different companies uh, to kind of blindly buy and sell each year, okay? Um, this is called the free lunch portfolio. It's similar to Joel Greenblatt's uh, magic formula portfolio. Um, and, you know, a third of this free lunch portfolio approach is shameless cloning, 
okay? And Pabrai nowhere in here says, you should understand these 15 businesses each year, okay? Um, but the idea here is that you can potentially still beat the market um, quite handily in, in some cases um, by doing a mechanical approach like this and not understanding the businesses. Now, whether you wanna call that investing or not investing, I don't know that it matters too much. I mean, at the end of the day, I just want financial independence, right? That's what Charlie Munger was seeking. That's what Warren Buffett were seeking. Um, I don't care if you call me an investor, all right? Now, I don't take this blind approach. I like to understand businesses. Uh, it's interesting to me. Um, so I don't, I don't blindly invest in companies. But my point here is that I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think you can still be a very successful investor, uh, even if you don't understand the businesses. If you're following, you know, say a cloning framework, a cloning investment approach uh, that, that makes sense, that's intelligently uh, set up, where you have rules that prevent you from uh, making those behavioral mistakes that so many investors make. So just wanted to share that before I get into this. Uh, but let's dive into Pabrai. What, what would we have done if we had simply blindly cloned Monish Pabrai for the last nearly six years? Okay. So the first step was to compile all of the data. Now, this is how many shares Pabrai held at the end of each of these quarters. Okay, so for example, September 30th, 2014, Pabrai had, you know, 4.5 million shares of Bank of America in his portfolio. And by tracking the changes over time, um, we can get a sense for uh, at, at around what price Pabrai is buying, around what price he's selling, uh, and we can even clone him. So for example, Look at Seritage Growth Properties. He first bought this company back in the first quarter of 2016. So I would have been able to see that Pabrai bought Seritage Growth Properties uh, when that 13F came out from the first quarter of 2016, which would have been you know, mid-May 2016. So the way I set this up, I'm assuming we're buying in uh, at the end of the month when we can find out what Pabrai has bought recently, okay? So I would buy Seritage Growth Properties at the end of May of 2016, if I'm following this approach. So that's what I did. I assumed I bought in at the end of the month when it was publicly known that Pabrai had bought and then sold out at the end of the month when it was publicly known that Pabrai had sold. Uh, and you can see here, the blue bolded companies are the ones that I'm including in uh, this analysis from the last six years. Um, these are companies that Pabrai has bought uh, within the last six years, kind of entered into. Uh, and I've included two that he hasn't sold yet, Micron and uh, the second round of Seritage Growth Properties. Um, just because, you know, He's, he's um, you know, he owns those and we can kind of, we, we've bought already if we're doing this shameless cloning approach. Uh, and, you know, it's just interesting to see where would we be today uh, based on those two holdings as well. So let's take a look. I've compiled this. So let's assume uh, we made equal bets on each of these companies that Pabrai bought over the last six years, okay? So we're investing $1,000 into each of them. $1,000 bet at the end of that month when we found out that Pabrai had bought in. So for Berkshire Hathaway, uh, we've got the buy-in price uh, and we've got the sell price. And, you know, Pabrai held that um, company for one year. So we can see we got a 29% annualized return if we had simply cloned that idea, which turns 1000 into $1,290. Now, Fiat Chrysler was a little trickier for me to analyze. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, Fiat you know, paid a decent number of dividends over the years. Um, they also spun off Ferrari, which I think Pabrai made even more money from Ferrari 
uh, than he did from you know the parent company Fiat Chrysler over that time. Uh, and it's just a little tricky to really get a sense for exactly you know what price point he bought in, what price point he sold out, um, and then incorporating the dividends and Ferrari into all of that. Uh, but I think in talks he said he got about a 5x from his Fiat Chrysler investment. So we're just going to make that same assumption here, which turns $1,000 into $5,000 over those five years. Uh, he bought in 2014, sold out kind of the, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Uh, so that's the only one I'm not kind of using hard kind of buy and sell dollar amounts for. Uh, Google, you can see, bought in around 557. If you're shamelessly cloning that bet, sold out around 1076. So that is almost a double in just over three years, which works out to 22% annualized rate of return. So you can see kind of the start and end figure there. Uh, now, Seritage Growth Properties, he bought in in 2016, uh, early 2016, and um, sold out a year later. I think the reason he sold out of Seritage, I think this was the company he had a conversation about Charlie Munger about, and Charlie Munger was just shaking his head, you know. And, you know, Pabri said, when you have a conversation about a stock you own with Charlie Munger and he's shaking his head, you immediately after that conversation go and you sell out of that position. And I think the issue there was um, they had all this valuable real estate, right, which, you know, they, they still have today uh, in large part. Um, but the idea that because the liquidation value was a certain amount and, you know, Sears was still tied to Seritage Growth Properties, um, you, you can't really value it based on the liquidation value because in order to realize that liquidation value, Sears has to shut down stores. They have to lay off, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. And it's, it's not a process that happens quickly. Uh, and so, you know, that having Sears still tied kind of to those assets um, made it a risky bet. And so uh, Charlie Munger helped Pabri realize that. And, and so he sold out. And that was one of the few losses that we would have taken by cloning Pabrai over the last uh, six years. Now, of course, he bought in again, Seritage Growth Properties. I think he bought in around $7, I would guess, back in uh, May of 2020. Um, if we were cloning, we'd have gotten it around $11.40. Uh, you can see this This is yesterday. I looked up the price and it was $18 per share. So, you know, just a handful of months, you've got a 58% return, uh, which is pretty solid. Obviously, that can head south tomorrow. Uh, he hasn't sold out of that, so we can't really tag on. Um, we can't say what his return was on, on Seritage yet, uh, but, but it's interesting nonetheless. Air Cap Holdings. You can see he owned for almost two years, 22% annualized return. Uh, if we were cloning that bet, uh, Southwest Airlines, a year and a half, uh, you know, kind of a, a weak 7% return from that one. Um, and then Micron, obviously he bought in just at the beginning of last year, I believe it was, uh, end of 2018 is, is when he bought into that. Um, of course, he's been buying since then uh, a little bit as well. So, you know, a, a pretty nice pop from Micron over the last, well, I guess it's oh, annualized 27%. So we're ahead of our target 26% annual return, which is doubling every three years. Um, we're, we're ahead of that mark so far on Micron. And Pabrai has said multiple times, he thinks Micron is one of these long-term compounders. So, um, and then finally, GraphTech. GraphTech is really the only flop that Pabrai uh, has bought into in the last six years. So, 
you know, we would have bought in $12.19-ish. Uh, and that was back in August of 2019. We would have bought that and then sold, you know, less than a year later, nine months later at $6.84 minus 44%. That's not annualized. That's just, you know, straight up minus 44%. <clears throat> I only I only annualized it when it made sense to annualize it when it was, you know, held for five years or you know more than more than a year at least. So, you know, that was a big hit. But then what I did here, so I assume I'm putting a thousand dollars into each of these bets. So I've got nine thousand dollars invested over these nearly six years, uh, and on that I get a fifth uh, in my portfolio. Uh, cash or, you know, what I own in Micron and Seritage at the moment, $15,284. So, you know, based on that equal weighted approach, that's a 9.7% annualized return over those almost six years. Now, that's basically uh, what you would have gotten from investing passively in the S&P 500 over that period. I think you might have done a little bit better in the S&P 500 because of that 1% and change uh, dividend from the S&P 500. But you're basically mimicking uh, the S&P 500. If you're doing an equal weighted cloning Pabrai approach over the last six-ish years. Uh, now I wanna note, these aren't necessarily Pabrai's results. These are the results of us you know, buying a, a little bit later than he did and then selling out a little bit later than he did. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and also keep in mind in the last four years, he's only bought three companies on the US stock market, okay? Uh, he's been doing a lot of buying in Turkey, in South Korea, in India, markets that I don't have access to, unfortunately. So, you know, this, there's not a lot to go off here over the last four years. Um, so keep that in mind as well. And then of course the vast majority here is a performance is really from that Fiat Chrysler bet, that 5X in five years. Uh, if you take that off, let's try to do that here. Let's see what happens. So if we take this away and this away, of course, I don't have any kind of. Never mind. Um, it, it really obviously dramatically reduces the returns if you remove that Fiat Chrysler bet. Um, we're at 8,000 versus 10,284. So, uh, pretty essential that, that we have this Fiat Chrysler bet in here. Uh, and it's a reminder, you know, uh, if you have a very concentrated approach like that like this, the vast majority of your returns are going to come from a very few bets that you make, okay? Um, so I, I wanted to do another exercise here. So this is equal weighted. Now, Pabrai didn't make equally weighted bets in these different investments, okay? So what I did is I decided, well, what if I figure out, you know, what was the weighting for each of these bets? And how would the performance be uh, if instead of $1,000 in each one, I had weighted those amounts by, you know, my best estimate of how Pabrai weighted them. And so here's this, this last chart that I came up with. So I came up with the bet size. How much did Pabrai likely put into each one of these based on when he bought, when he bought in uh, and how many shares? And then I added up all the bet sizes and I've got the total bet size and then I get the conviction by simply dividing the bet size by the sum of all of the bet sizes. Um, obviously, th this is happening over time. So, you know, there's going to be a little bit of discrepancy because uh, por portfolio value changes over time. But I figure this is a good enough uh, estimate of, you know, conviction that Pabrai has had in these different companies. So... Uh, you can see here, his biggest bet was Fiat Chrysler, okay? 
that was the biggest, uh, he put the most number of chips in on Fiat Chrysler in terms of these U.S. holdings. Uh, Micron, just behind it, a percent behind it, percent and a half. Uh, and what's interesting to note here is, you know, if you look at Fiat and Micron in terms of how they did, Fiat did far and away the best. Uh, Micron, you know, is doing very well. It's compounding at 27% per year. So, uh, you know, based on conviction, uh, it changes the, the performance a little bit. And we can see that here when I came up with the, the weighted bets um, based on conviction. So essentially I took... Um, you know, I added all these up, $9,000, and then I just multiplied it by the conviction to get these uh, weighted bets. Multiply by the factor, uh, which I calculated here. It's simply the result divided by the investment or, you know, what the investment becomes over that investment period. And now we've got the results here. So we can see if we're looking at weighting the bets, um, we've just more than doubled in almost six years, okay? Uh, which is 13.5% annualized versus somewhere around 10% for the S&P 500. So, you know, nothing groundbreaking here. Um, I was a little, little disappointed that uh, the performance wasn't higher. Um, but like I said, Pabrai was spending quite a bit of time overseas in the last four years. Um, and... You know, he, he seems pretty bullish on both Seritage and Micron uh, over the next 10 years. So, you know, that, that's part of the big bet infrequent bet approach is, you know, you don't get a bunch of great investments at the same time. It's, it's very lumpy. And um, it's not difficult to argue that, yeah, the U.S. market has perhaps been a little bit overheated, uh, overpriced in the last um, three or four years. And it's it's been challenging for Pabrai to find things in the U.S., which makes sense that he would be shopping outside of the U.S. Um, but anyway, guys, I just thought this was an interesting exercise. Of course, if you want to, you know, slice and dice the data uh, in any way that you see better fit, uh, I'm going to link to this spreadsheet in the description and you can pull, you know, all of these numbers that I compiled from the 13F filings over the last, you know, five years and, and three quarters. So have a look at that if you feel so inclined. Um, and, you know, obviously this doesn't cover his international holdings. Check out uh, Investing with Tom did a video a couple days ago kind of talking about some of the different international holdings that Pabrai owns. Uh, you might find that video interesting. I, I recommend that one. Um, but yeah, that's all I got, guys. Just wanted to share how cloning Pabrai would have served you uh, in the U.S. over the last nearly six years. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to see more videos like this, let me know in the comments. Uh, this was fun. You know, it was a lot easier than compiling the data for, for Michael Burry. Because, you know, you saw Michael Burry had, I think, 32 uh, stocks just in 2020, right? He was long 20, 32 different companies this year. Of course, you go back six years and Pabrai has only owned, what is it, 15 companies. You know, if you factor in this, this double counting of General Motors, Common, and Warrants, and then the uh, Ross Holdings, 15 companies. So it's a lot easier to, to kind of slice and dice the data. Uh, and I've been really curious about this. So I was glad to be able to crack this nut. And um, yeah, interesting stuff. Hopefully with his new focus on long-term compounders versus buying a dollar for 50 cents, uh, cloning may prove to be a little bit more fruitful over the next six years versus the last six years. Uh, but I will leave you guys with that and see you in the next video. Take care.